Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again in another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I'm your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to the Masks of Naralathotep campaign in the English chapter, where things have gone from bad to potentially worse. More on that in a minute. First, a thank you to all of our patrons. Uh, Again, your support is the wind beneath our wings, or possibly the fog in our hotel. Either way, uh, we greatly appreciate what you do, and I know the players here appreciate it as well. So uh, we'll start with introductions to my right. This is Lonnie. I'm playing Lawrence Edward Oliver Forsyth. And uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to breathe right now. Yeah, it uh, gets you all choked up. Uh, So uh, to his right. This is Morgan. I play Lillian Lane and nobody is the boss of me. Not anyone. Not on this earth. Not your father. Not your mother. (laughs) You are the most important person in the world. Yep. Uh, to Miss Lane's right. This is James. I will be playing Dr. Sigmund Tartenbach, who is contemplating something most dire. wonder what that might be. Um, and to uh, the doctor's right. This is Tiffany, and I play Maeve O'Shea. I hope I'm safe. I mean, there's always hope, right? At least most times. Last, most certainly not least... This is Alex. I'll be playing Simone Gonger, and uh, apparently you can ship all sorts of things on the Ivory Wind. It's even Norwegian ship captains. Even. even. So we will raise the curtain tonight back at the Waldorf, where when last we left our investigators, their conjoined hotel room had been plunged into darkness after a handwritten, um, we'll call it thank you note, from one Edward Gavigan and... The strangest fog had spilled into their room. After accosting several uh, of the uh, investigator crew, uh, the investigators are going to continue their struggle with an entity that they cannot seem to grasp fully while they paw in the darkness for answers. And so, fittingly, we will will begin this uh, exchange with uh, Miss Lane. All right. I think when last we left, I was pushed by Mr. Forsyth. Where? How dare he push you? All right. And am I on the ground or am I standing? Yeah, so you've been pushed basically onto your butt. I, I, I sit there in a huff, kind of like being a spoiled child that's going to throw a mild temper tantrum. And what is Forsyth's, like, is he still choking? Uh, he is. Um, so from your view, the little view that you have from the candlelight, uh, you see that this fog has invaded his mouth and his nose, and it's streaming in through his ears. I know I'm still hurting everything, but I'm going to do go as fast as I can to shove him away from the smoke and yell at him that that smoke's not meant for him. It's meant for me. Okay, that's fair. Uh, so go ahead and make me a fighting brawl roll against. Uh, okay. Um, and and you're going to be at advantage because currently Mr. Forsyth is being held. 32 out of 25. But you're at advantage, so you go ahead and roll again. Okay. I got a 47 out of 25. <laughs> okay, so yeah. depending upon if you'd like to push that roll... The first one you could? Yes, I'd like to push it. Okay. So how would you push it? I would, to be able to push him out of the way, I would use my good side and, you know, and put all my um, brute strength from my shoulder into shoving him out of the way. 
I mean, you stop and, and adjust yourself for a minute and think, I'll use my good side, and then remember, both of your sides are just as good. <laughs> so I use the one with the hurt ankle. Sure. <laughs> it can't hurt, right? No. Go ahead and, and push the roll, make another brawl roll. <laughs> okay. Um, so you step forward, and you go to push him out of the way. And you shove off with the, as, as much as you can struggle up with your uh, with your frame against his. And when you push him and push him hard, your ankle gives way and you take a point of damage and you collapse onto the floor uh, with a, a, sear, a searing heat and pain from your ankle. I cry out <sighs> and I start holding my ankle. Very good, very good. Miss O'Shea, you're carving into the wood floor still. Uh, you figure you just need a little bit more time to to make these the lines appear the way they're supposed to, but you're also going to need something to fuel this working, and it's going to have to come from you. I'll cut my hand. So I'm going to finish the lines and then cut my hand and slam it in the center of it. So you slam your bloodied hand into this fiery eye in the middle of this carving that you've done. And something releases inside of you. It's almost this snap mechanism, as if there's this gulf of held breath that finally and eagerly exhales out into the room. And the fog pushes against it for a moment, but there is a equally and yet overcoming push back from you and the tendrils that are down Mr. Forsythe's throat are violently ripped right back out and he collapses onto the floor. The blood continues to course out of your hand and you feel like your left hand has adhered itself to the floor a bit, almost as if there's a, an emulsification that's happened and blood is seeping out from the wound but yet the floors and the etching almost seem to be drawing it out of your palm well I'll sit there and stare until I see that it has gone before I try and pull my hand up focusing on continuing that Mm -hmm. uh, protective working doctor The room that the ladies are in Mm -hmm. and that Mr. Forsyth went went to help out in is filled with some sort of red mist. Uh, Does it have a... uh, Am I I near enough to experience any of it? Uh, You're not near enough to experience it directly, but what you're seeing it through is the diffused light of... Forsyth's electric torch, which is on the ground in this room. It's pointed at that doorway. Hey. Um, and the doorway is open? It is. I can say, and is it is the or is the area beyond filled with darkness or more of this swirling darkness? Or it's more of this sort of cloudy, now almost red tinted fog. Huh. What well, makes it really hard to see, and it's exceptionally dark. Uh, mm-hmm. am I, I have my doctor's bag right now, right? You do? Wonderful. I reach in and pull out old Betsy okay. and, uh, make sure that she is loaded. Um, yeah. And, uh, I really don't want to, but this foggy shit in the hallway there, uh, there are fire extinguishers in the building. We'll deal with it later. I'm going to thump a flare into the middle of it down this hallway. Because I heard footsteps, and since I heard footsteps, there's people. This might be a manifestation of something, and if that's the case, then having a flare go off in your face is usually pretty distracting. Sure. So you're going to open the conjoined room door and then fire down the hallway, yes? Yep. Okay. So you open the conjoined uh, hallway door, and when you open the door, there is a man standing there and you see that he has a crooked implement in his hand Hmm. it's a it looks like a cudgel 
and there are several nails driving through it. Can I shoot him with the flare and then slam the door? Uh, you can shoot him with the flare. I don't know about slam the door, but... Okay. Well, definitely going to shoot him in the face with the flare then. <laughs> I, okay. I don't know who he is, but he's clearly standing outside with a barroom brawl implement and doesn't mean well, so I'm going to say... I'm pretty sure yeah. I described that that's what the cultists carry. Oh, that's right. That you did. Okay, so that's even better. Yeah. So, um... Give us a roll. 14 under 20 success. Sounds good enough for me. 1d10 plus 1d3 burn, sir. So the d10 is 7 and the d3 burn is... Uh, that would be 2 points of damage. Okay. So 9 total. Uh, so you stand fast and when you see him... When, when, when you open the door and there's a man basically preparing to to come in after you and do God's only know what to your body, life, and limb against your own teachings, against your own ethical codes, you make a very hard choice. It is yep. you or them. And when you pull the trigger on the flare gun, the sun blossoms for a moment in the room. And it is hot and it is red and it blots out everything in the hallway for a moment. Riding on the wave of that visual is an arcing sound, and that sound is the high-pitched tones of the very breath of life leaving a man's body. And you shut the door. I killed him. You're fairly certain. Yep, I shut the door. I don't want to see that. Forsyth, for you, still grappling with the reality of this whole situation, you see in the open hallway a blossom of light. It is not as direct for you as it is for Sigmund, but what it does show you is the extent of this form, this whip-like bundle of tentacles. And it begins to rapidly dissipate almost as if the light itself eats away like the morning sun would on a fog I just kind of lay there dumbly looking at it just trying basically to recover my breath so footsteps hustle down towards your door Lillian and even through the pain of your ankle and the, the heaving of Forsyth's breaths you get the feeling that more is coming through this doorway. Um, I struggle to stand up and get to my feet. And leaning on the... If I'm close to the wall, a wall, I'd like to lean on the wall. I Am I still in my madness? Uh, yeah, just for a little bit. I go over to my suitcase and I grab my shotgun. Okay. And am I allowed to make any more actions? And you can turn. I turn to face where the sound is coming, like the sound of footsteps is coming from. Okay. A moment later, a man steps through the doorway. Same sort of nasty-looking cudgel in his hand. And the first thing he sees is Forsyth on the ground. Because, again, it's dark. Uh, and there's but a lone candle in the room at this point. You can see him in, as a vague shape, not truly defined. Uh, but you definitely make out the shape of, of someone who for some reason, more concerned about foresight than you. I yell at him to get his attention. What is it that you want? You can deal with me and not them. He looks up for a second, and he steps towards you. I pack my shotgun. Mr. Shea, you are uh, continuing to hold your position? Yes. The mist and stuff dissipated, correct? It did. And uh, you will take a, a hit point worth of damage from oh, right. the blood loss. That makes sense. Would I be able to cast a baleful influence on this guy? <laughs> um, yeah, he can hear your voice. You'd have to stand up and give him some direct... Well, I'm still going to be in the symbol, so that's fine. I will yeah. stand and I will like look at him and tell him... <laughs> no. You should have the system for baleful influence, yes? Yeah, it's uh, an opposed pow roll. When you say leave now, point at the window. Point at the window. <laughs> uh, 
foe's pow. 47 out of 65. Yeah, Damn. he is not going to be able to beat you on that. All right. Leave now. The voice ripples out through the room. And Lillian, when you when you hear her say, leave now, uh, you snap out of this mental constraint that you're in. I shake my head and kind of look around. The person that you look at is Maeve. And she looks, I don't know, there's something different about her. It's almost as if there is a welling of strength. It's almost a, a ferocity that you're not used to seeing from her. I look at her with admiration and awe as much as I can muster right now. So the guy with the cudgel turns. He wants nothing to do with whatever's going on in here. Doctor? Yeah. You're uh, free to give an action. Okay. Let me see here. He is turning and like walking out of the room. No, he is not walking. He's okay. going to hustle. Well, He's going to hustle. He probably looks a little scared. Yeah. And so, like a blind run? Probably, yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, then, with the casual grace of the old school slapstick Buster Keaton, I'm going to stick my foot out. <laughs> I want him to fall flat on his face on the ground here, and then I'm going to sit on him and and holler for Forsyth. We have one dead one out there, but a live one is a lot more valuable. Um, he trips over your foot because he's not paying any attention to anything other than what he's been told to do. Uh, when he trips over your foot and you go to, like, kind of, like, land on him and, and, and you know, sit upon him, Mm -hmm. uh, you can tell that he's scrambling to continue to leave. He's he's almost desperate. Okay. I really don't want that to happen because uh, he, he has information that I want. Do I see what he's running from? He keeps looking back. Like, did I see Maeve do her, her juju on him? You would him? probably hear it. You would hear her say, you would have heard her voice when it went, out over the rooms like she was high above any other sounds hmm. the hallway here is a little illuminated if only for the embers of the flare gun that has gotten into the wallpaper here and is now like singed and burned things sure no active fire per se oh good oh darn I really only used the flare gun so that I could jump on the fire bandwagon. Right. Everybody gets a turn. <laughs> uh, I I holler for Forsyth. Mr. Forsyth, you're still coming around. Why don't you give me a constitution roll? Sure, I can do that. All right. Constitution. Oh, I will spend uh, two luck to make that an 80 out of 80. Okay. Uh, you come to your feet a little bit. Uh, first, your knees, you, you get into the all fours position, and uh, you're still mm -hmm. coughing and, and racking through uh, whatever, whatever that, that, was. that was. It's horrible. It, it, it feels like you had, you had pneumonia once as a kid. It feels like that. It feels like the Humidity of Panama's taking a vacation in your lungs. I stumble towards the doctor. Help me weigh him down quickly, and we need to tie him up. I'll uh, fall on him if I can. You can <laughs> definitely fall on him. You can sit upon him, that's for sure. Um, he is raving and desperate to get away. And he keeps saying something like, I have to do what she says. I have to do what she says. You have to let me up. I holler out to Maeve, tell him to sleep. I don't know if she can hear me. Hopefully she can hear me. I will uh, look over at the guy and... You have to come out in the hallway. Oh, do I? Yeah, yeah you, he's in the hallway. Oh, okay. Then I will have to come out to the hallway and look at him and tell him sleep. You're going to spend for baleful influence? Yeah. I only have a little bit left. I'm not going to give him a power roll. He's just going to fall asleep, but you have to spend for it. That's fine. He passes out. Wunderbar. I uh, quickly locate some, I don't know, towels or something to tie him up with. 
It's still dark. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, it is still dark in here. It's still uh, dark. I light him on fire for some light, and then I look <laughs> to tie him up with. No, I'm kidding. Uh, is uh, Lonnie's torch, his Forsyth's torch, still on the ground here? Yeah, it is. I grab that. Look around quickly yeah. down the hallway and such, where it was smoldering, and make sure there's no fire. Yeah, there's no fire, but that wallpaper's uh, seen better days at this point. Uh, you it. see the body of the guy that you hit, and he does not look well. In fact, he looks less than well. Significantly less than well? Yeah, his chest is fairly well caved in by the incendiary device that went off basically at ground zero. It burned all of his clothing. It burned his face, his chest. And it kind of nestled a little, it made a little nest inside of his chest cavity before basically liquefying his heart and bones. The doc looks at his wounds, doesn't crouch down, just looks down at his wounds with a cold calculation before closing the door and going back inside. Another moment passes and the lights begin to flicker back on. Good, because uh, I'm going to turn around and uh, go find something to wrap my hand in. Yeah, you're bleeding all over the place. Mm -hmm. Lillian, what are you doing? I just gather my bearings and I, I feel a little out of sorts after that incident of madness. Um, I see that I'm holding my shotgun and kind of wonder how I went and picked it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't really remember a ton of what happened. Yeah, and my ankle's really hurting now, like really, really? badly. <laughs> so I go and how you know, really kind of limp to put my shotgun away and just kind of collapse on on the bed. Okay, I will leave you all there for a moment. Back to the ivory wind with Simone. You've subdued um, the captain. You you think he's okay? You're fairly certain. Okay, so I will, I don't really have much use for this beyond this point, so I will use the rest of my bottle to kind of saturate the cloth, and I will tuck it into the box with him. I'm not going to, like, stuff it up his nose, necessarily, <laughs> but I just want to, you know, keep him a little, a little out of it while I put the lid back on. Yeah, makes sense to me. Getting the lid back on is not hard. I'm going to... Put on my best uh, posture, my best drunken captain posture, and I am going to confidently stride past the galley. While I'm passing by, I'm gonna make like some, like, I'll make like a, like an assertive grunt. <laughs> so I'm just gonna walk past them and kind of gesture in that general direction, and I'm gonna walk with purpose up onto the deck. Okay. Making a bunch of noise. Yeah, I mean they seem to acknowledge your presence and then you know go back to playing cards okay where's that rover oh there he is at the stern you there it turns around got some people coming in gotta keep some eyes out constable might be coming and I'll keep walking with purpose to basically like the I guess the the rail closest to the ramp okay um so that I can see you said that we're like there were more there were more out on the dock, right? Yep. There would be like one, two, three, like two more maybe. I'll get to the rail. How hard would it be for me to get their attention from here? Not hard at all. Like, I are, mean, they in, it's are they in shouting distance? Easily. You there, I got people coming. I'll like clap my hands together. Like, you know, wave my hands in the air and like you get their attention. Start gesturing at I guess the if they're like carts or barrels. Truck should be here soon. Make sure that they got the message and I'll turn away from them a bit and I'll try to get to a higher position on the boat. Okay. Like, I don't know if, how the deck's kind of separated. I'm going to try to get to, like, the most visible point on the boat. Yeah, you can get that to... Isn't, um, like a crow's nest. I wouldn't call it, like, a relaxation deck by any means, but there is a spot above where you have a better view of the main deck of the ship. I'm going to go up there and I will take out my torch, wrap my scarf around it, and I will point it at the sails and basically wave it back and forth for a bit until I see a truck. Okay. I won't like stand there and do it perpetually, but you know, I'll keep signaling until I see a truck. Okay. You see a couple of the men come on board. They, they holler up. 
I thought we were done with shipments. The uh, constable got wind of something. We need to swap some of these out. Keep some eyes out. Yes, yes. Get back. Get down there. You turn around and they go to another part of the... You see them go out like onto the prop, the main uh, deck. One goes to the main part of the deck in the front. And then you see another leave the ship onto the dock. And they head towards what you believe is the gate, the front gate to the dock near you. Okay. So it looks like they kind of get into position? Yeah. Okay, great. I breathe a bit and keep trying to signal for the truck that I hope is there. After about 10 or 15 minutes, you see a truck slowly starting to turn up the main thoroughfare for Limehouse. Moves a little slower than the rest of traffic normally does here. And so it makes you think that that could be your crew. Yeah, they might be leery. I will, uh, if they seem to be like hesitating, I'll flash them again and kind of like, I guess, motion with the light, trying trying to like wave them in. Okay. Why don't you make me a luck roll? We'll see if they grab on you or not. Don't have a whole lot of this left. That's what makes it interesting. Uh, uh, 19 out of 27. Two. Just enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you flash it up and down you, a couple times side to side, and, you're, and then all of a sudden the truck speeds up a little bit. <sighs> thinking about the cap. I'm just, I'm just thinking about them while uh, I'm just wait, waiting to see what they do, basically. Um, once they get down, like once they're, once they're, I guess once it looks like they're parking, mm-hmm. I will shuffle down the the ramp. Again, I'm keeping, I'm keeping the hat low. I'm I'm making sure there's a lot of bustle to my steps. So I'm, I'm trying not to linger near the crew too much. And I'm just going to kind of stride out to the truck. Okay. You stride out. Uh, the guy that went towards the gate pulls the gate open. Like wave them through. You see your, uh, the man you paid in the driver's seat. He's driving very aggressively probably because the the steering on this truck is terrible but yeah, um, drive it into the I'll air. walk up I'll walk up next to the driver's side door kind of facing away from the guy okay and I'll walk, walk parallel to the truck is the window down is there a window uh there's yeah there's a window it it is down okay so kind of like speaking through my hand um and like kind of you know muffling myself with the beard you got some packages to move on board, right? And some things to take off. You see the guy nod. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll show you which ones we're moving. Follow me. I'll continue to, like, wave the truck in position. Okay. Once it slows down to, like, a, I guess, a crawl, I'm, I'm going to pop the back open. I'm guessing the crew's probably back there if I don't see them, like, walking. Yeah, you don't see them walking. You didn't see them in the cab either. All right, so you're probably you pop open the back of it. You see two guys sitting back there. They're, they get on their feet. Let's get moving. I turn away from them, and are we going to have to use, like, the uh, the winch and stuff to get the stuff out and in? Probably. All right. So here's what I would like to do. Well, I guess let me know how this plays out, but I would like to get my crew from where they are with their first set of boxes the whole time I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to let on who I am or, or that I'm aware of them. I'm just I'm trying to play the captain's role. So I'm gonna get them down to the hold, point out the boxes that need to go out. Before we send them out, I'm going to switch the labels from the boxes that they're bringing to the ones that I'm putting back on the truck. Okay. So let's see here. During the first setup, like the first time I bring them down there, I immediately go to check on the captain. Okay. Um, why don't you? Are you checking on him, like medically speaking? More like, is he is he dead, or is he sleeping still? If, if he's or if he's is he stirring? Those are those are basically the three conditions I'm concerned about. <laughs> uh, he is not stirring. He does not appear to be dead. So if you actually check to see if he's breathing, he is breathing, but it is pretty shallow. Does he look thoroughly medicated? Oh, yeah. Right, I'll take the, I'll take the rag out and stuff back in my pocket. Close the lid back. I'll kind of clap him on the shoulder. It'll be over soon. And I go back to the crew, and I am just kind of I'm going to wave them in and out, 
until they're done, and I will swap the labels as uh, as things are moved. I don't know how long this is going to take. Well, I'm going to say it will probably take about 20 minutes mm-hmm. with both crews being amenable to the work, but to get there, we need to have an acting role from you to make sure yes. people can uh, believe your disguise. I would like to spend 10 luck. For what? <sighs> For Master, oh, master disguise. disguise. Okay. To give myself a bonus die to... <laughs> Is it disguise or acting? Um, I would say that it's... And if someone is trying to detect it, mm-hmm. their difficulty is hard. With... Roll myself. Oh, so what's a bonus die? I've never actually so used So a bonus die is basically a bonus tens die for you. So mm-hmm. you would roll two tens die. Yes, basically. Acting! That's a two. I'm going to take okay, that. Okay, it's fair. <laughs> the ruse continues. The men on the ship buy it. The men you contracted, you can tell that they look long and hard at you just to, they, they almost don't believe. I'm going to, like, if I if I sense their doubt, I'm going to use the, my, their crew, the ship's crew, to kind of, like, reinforce it. So if, I, if, I'm, if I'm near, let's say, one of the, one of the people that I hired, um, and he looks a little concerned, I will kind of reassert myself with a member of the Ivory Wind crew. Um, I'll, I'll clap my hands to try to get him to, to pick up the pace or... Yeah, I'll, I'm going to be a bully to my crew if the other guys seem suspect. Okay. You get into the role of being a captain. Uh, it comes fairly easy to you because you've seen so many authoritarian bullies before. It's not hard mm. to ape their uh, mannerisms because they're so prevalent in society. I get, I get real puffy. <laughs> the chest is way up. And I'll scratch the beard a lot because it probably is just a <laughs> Okay. So back at the hotel, the lights have come back up. Even the lights outside are back on. And you're all trying to make at least some sense of what happened. Amongst the spilled dishes and the singed wallpaper, the now dead body in the hallway, amongst all that, Lillian, you do find the thank you note from Edward Gavigan. Like the the one that said lights out? That's right. Okay, so I pick it up again. Is there anything else on there that I missed? No, there's nothing else on there. But the handwriting is unmistakable. Hmm. Is there anybody in the room with me? Or is it just me by myself? No, I mean, there's. I mean, I assume your compatriots around. I, I'm assuming that Maeve is bandaging her hand or the doctor's helping her. Um, yeah, um, oh, you know. the doctor seemed busy, so I'm just wrapping my hand up and I'm going to pick up my book from the symbol um is there a rug on the floor there are rugs here yes so I'm probably going to pull a rug over it (laughs) I don't think that's I mean the rest of the room is trashed I think we're (laughs) we're not getting our deposit back Maeve yeah so I call out to anybody that can hear me in the room um and let them know yeah, guys, I, I, I think we're going to have to pack up and move on after we, you know, do I know that doctor has a, 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 a hostage or whatever, a, somebody to question? Uh, yeah, you're fairly certain, at least from the sounds of the hallway. Uh, shouldn't we bring him into the room? Well, actually, I, I as soon as uh, I get the chance, uh-huh. uh, I drag his, I drag him into mine in the doctor's bedroom. Okay. Sh- should we grab the and dead then body? I bind him up. No. Leave it where it is. Okay. Yeah, I think we need to pack up and move on somewhere. Should we no. call Scotland Yard first? No. Leave everything yes. where it is. We will leave in a few minutes, but we need to do this properly. Yes. Call Scotland Yard. But first, before we call Scotland Yard, we need to ask him questions. First, questioning. Then we call Scotton Yard. While we are calling Scotton Yard, pack up your things. We will be leaving soon. But if we do this in the wrong order, we will look suspicious and we will be vulnerable. We'll look suspicious. Okay, so, Doctor, in what questions are you going to begin to ask then? Uh, I go into, or the Doctor goes into the room and uh, first. 
Forsyth, do you have any handcuffs or shackles of any sort? Uh, or even rope? I know it is not no. something you usually carry. Uh, no, I have handcuffs. The doctor <laughs> kind of pauses at that. All right. Well, I will need them. I lean over and rummage out of my uh, suitcase and I toss the doctor my handcuffs. Okay. Uh, I handcuff him to the bed. So he's not going anywhere. All right, anywhere. you guys are taking this too far. Nope. Just <laughs> far enough. Yeah, wake him up. I actually go in my bag and find a uh, smelling salts ampule. Oh boy. Yep. He's you wake waking. him up pretty quick. <laughs> yep, he's going to wake up quick like. I make sure that Forsyth is ready. And he Some jolts sort of awake weapon. and yeah. shakes in the chair. Step back so that I'm not within swinging or kicking or biting distance here. Okay. Yeah, he um, jerks in the chair two or three times. He gets a real almost um, cornered wild animal look to his face. He starts baring his teeth and Shh, 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 my friend, my friend. We did, we do not mean you any harm. Please calm down, calm down. Now, I would like to ask you a few questions, if that is okay with you. Can I get a psychology roll on him? Sure. Fantastic. Oh my god, 99 out of 79. That is, it literally only gets one worse, so... Uh, what were you yeah. attempting to ascertain? Uh, I wanted to see his mental state, as in how much stability is this guy? Is he literally just like a big bundle of crazy with a knife? Or is he, does he seem to be fairly well put together who just happens to believe a certain set of dogma? He's trying to play it off as if he's just a bundle of crazy. But it's clear to you that he knows far more than he's he's letting on. All right. Well, you did not. Have, I did not want it to come down to this. Go and grab my doctor's bag. Very slowly and deliberately, deliberately put it down in front of him on a table next to him. Okay. Look, look over at the door. I'm. Are are um, is Maeve and Lillian still there? Or that's a good question. Maeve? No, Lillian. I'm packing. I have hobbled over to watch what the Dr. Lawrence are doing to this guy. Oh, well. In my face? That's rude. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. That's rude. I'm glad you got where I was going with that. Okay, I turn around and go to pack my things with a sad face. <laughs> okay, so I guess what I, I'd like to know doctor is how far are you intending to take this right up to the point of putting well I'm, I'm very slowly and deliberately pulling out various medical instruments and putting them on the table while maintaining eye contact with him and sure. uh, poker po po poker face um, I'm playing it very you know matter of factly more like I'm taking a part of frog in biology class okay and a syringe I pull out just a few cc's of saline solution something harmless but I don't let him sure. see what I'm putting into the syringe and uh yeah then we start asking questions okay you question the man yeah even the simplest of questions right who are you who sent you stuff like that um the man cuffed to the chair is just a just bereft of any sane responses. He talks about he talks about what he's been sent to do, how important it is, how much it means to the cause. He speaks in wide generalities, even when asked to to nail down who was it directly that sent him, where did you come from? He can't be nailed down. It's as if his mind is only filled with a certain amount of generalities. And other than that, it's pretty much just a psychotic stew. Yeah. He's a ball of crazy. 
Oh, okay. Ball of crazy. Well, I don't think we're going to get anything out of this ball of crazy. Look over at Forsyth. Now call Scotland Yard. I go out and I call Scott and I call ring the front desk. Uh, and... You ring the front desk. Yes, I'm. Um, I, uh, yes. You're a, a very panicked man. Answer the phone. Yes, I uh, need you to contact. Uh, well, I need an outside line to Scotland Yard. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, right away. So, is everything all right up there? Everything's fine now. But please get me that outside line to Scotland Yard. A few moments pass. You hear a few more tones on the phone. And then you hear a strong, firm voice pick up the other end. Inspector Barrington. Mike, while he's on the phone, I close the door and I lock it. Okay. May, may I say who's calling? It's quietly. Yes. Uh, tell him his, Tell him Lawrence Forsyth is calling, and it's very important. Of course. Uh, you get rung up to Barrington's office. Forsyth, what, uh, what seems to be the matter? Barrington, uh, we, I need you to come to the uh, Waldorf now. We have a situation, and someone uh, tried to attack Miss Lane. I believe it's related to your case. Dear God. Stay there. Don't go anywhere. Myself and my men will be right over. Is anyone hurt? Understood. Yes. Not yet. Hmm. But he's, 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 uh, he's, not, he's not worried about it right now. Hmm. All right. I shall be right over. I go out into the hallway and drag the body inside the room. Okay. You go outside to grab the body. And when you do, mm-hmm. you see that there is a young woman standing nearby, hand over her mouth, pale as a ghost, staring at this body. What? That I won't that I won't drag the body. What 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 what, what happened? What happened to him? There's been an accident. The uh, police are on their uh, way. He, Ma'am, he's... you'd best go inside. She leans against the wall somewhat involuntarily. Oh, oh my. Oh. She turns around and tries to, like, stumble back towards her room. You mm-hmm. just cost her some sanity. That's it's I going around. I do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I would talk to the guy who put a flare shot into his chest. Speaking of sanity, Mike. Yeah. I quickly fill a different syringe with some morphine. Mm Mm-hmm. And I jab it into his leg. Okay. Enough to sedate, not enough to kill. Sure. And then I quickly, knowing that I only have maybe five minutes, ten minutes before the police, before the constables get here. I, uh, and, and after a moment or two when he starts to calm down greatly, I, uh, open the box with the feet. Okay. I don't want to put them on in case something bad happens. Yeah. You're going to put them on his feet? But I have a perfect guinea pig here. Wow. So, yeah, when his feet stop moving enough, I'm going to put the feet on his feet. Feet okay. on feet. Feet on feet action, folks. <laughs> Only on the Old Ways podcast. That's it's terrible. For you. It's not. That's a terrible ad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in certain markets. Anyways, um, only feet. Right. Only feet. <laughs> you you pull off his shoes, mm-hmm. and you slip these moist. Oh, I forgot that they were moist. Somehow, still moist, moist feet. Facsimile feet onto his feet and they, they they slide on pretty smooth you have to the toughest part for you though is tucking his toes into the right toe holes <laughs> on each one that gets to be a bit of a challenge it's almost like a um, child's um, glove in that yeah, regard like putting on a putting on a glove I, I pat him on the leg after the first one how do those fit how does that feel before I move on to the second one you can feel his feet adjust inside of you. You hear the squishing, like inside. There's almost a gelatinous sort of audible sound. It's it's like someone's stuck their hand into a jar of jelly and is kind of scooping it around. A squelch. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Uh, and then I quickly slide the other foot onto his foot. He sits up, bolt up in the chair, still, still handcuffed. Sure. His legs are dancing back and forth. They're, they're you know, almost, he's almost pitter pattering on the floor and you can hear the squishing now has, has gotten this almost rapid, almost wine making sort of squish now. Fantastic. The doctor leans back against, uh, steps back a little bit and leans back and watches what unfolds. Takes a, uh, takes a sip out of his scotch. After that, he settles down. You see his muscles in his shoulders kind of roll backwards. And you start seeing his head fall back as your morphine takes full effect. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But his feet keep moving. Because the feet do not stop moving. Do they even break tempo? Uh, they do eventually break tempo, yeah. And eventually, probably another minute or two after that, the feet stop. Good. Because when they stop, I pull them back off. Okay. And I put them back in their box. And I put the box under the bed. Okay. When the lady gets goes back in her room, yep. I toss the body. Toss it where? Out the window. <laughs> I search the bo- I search I search the body. Okay. Yeah. I, identification. No, there's there's no identification. The gentleman had a, a cudgel nearby. There are some uh, somewhat strange identifying marks on his body. They're brands, but they're not symbols that you recognize at all. Okay. But no no paperwork on him. No. No. Okay. All right. And I will stand there and wait for the police. Okay. Lillian, you get done hobbling around your room and packing. Um, Maeve, after you've bandaged your hand, you find a rug from the other room and pull it in here to cover the mark on the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you packing as well? Yes. You have an awful lot more to pack at this point. Yeah, I gotta put my books back in the trunk and only have a couple books in my bag and then, yeah. Okay. I gotta put the all the uh, goodies that Jack and Lillian brought back. I'm gonna put that in the trunk. Oh, I gotta retrieve the uh, mask with the tongue from underneath the bed and put that in the trunk. There's all sorts of nasty things that you have to figure out where you're going to put them. And the towels you... from the bathroom. Right. <laughs> Don't forget the towels. And the robe. And the robe. Yep. But you have a new big trunk to put things in. Yes. Which uh, Sigmund has gifted you so that that, uh, that will work out splendidly. So we're going to go back to the ship. Simone, the exchanging of cargo goes like clockwork. People listen to your heavy-handed captain's tone with the clarity you're not familiar with. If only your fellow investigators would would offer such uh, dutiful responses. <laughs> they live longer. So as as we're kind of wrapping up, keeping the crew busy is probably not a problem. So um, as we're kind of as they're moving the last shipment out, I am going to try to find. A, a, a window of time to move the captain to his room. So it means I have to carry him basically from the crate through the hole, through the galley, right, to what I believe is the quarters. Okay. So yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to move him. Okay. And try to get him to his room. Not a problem. With everybody else so busy. I will tuck him in, quietly thank him for the hat, and I will make my way back on deck. I'll, t- I'll take my last trip. As I walk by the crew, like the crew of the ship, mm-hmm. say, uh, Rada Rum, I gotta go grab some more, and I'll just head off the ship. Okay. Grumbling to myself. Now, all the money that the captain had won was in his in his clothes, right? Yep. Okay. That money, I leave in the galley. A pretty easy drop off for you. I got on the table where they were, where he was, where they were getting, you know, their money taken. <laughs> <laughs> so I leave it there. And I will make sure that the truck and its cargo 
is uh, stowed properly, and I will try to find the driver. I forgot that uh, uh, the, the foreman. Yep. Uh, you know where you're taking this thing. Are you still? Are you still in disguise? Yes. He looks a little, a little uncomfortable. I was like, okay, we, we've uh, we've got a place to take it. Yeah. All right, then I'll clap my other back and I'll walk by him. Okay. <laughs> he looks confident, right? Like he didn't want to tell me. He does a double take like at you for a second. Okay. And then smirks and pulls um, the window up. Okay. Um, yeah, I see them out and I will follow the truck out. And like as it turns, I just kind of continue walking into the night. And until I am out of visible range of the the ship and the docks themselves, and I will take off my hat. I'm going to bow to no one, <laughs> <laughs> but I take a bow in the middle of the street and keep walking. Very well, Mr. Forsyth, the members of Scotland's Yard's finest arrive at your doorstep. In effect, yeah, they find me standing in the hallway over the body. They do. He's Barrington with his wide. Almost a handlebar broom mustache smooths it over. Good God. Uh, two men tried to attack Miss Lane in her uh, in her hotel room. Evidently, they were unaware that she wasn't traveling alone. Hmm. Uh, this poor fellow. Well, you see what happened to him. Uh, the other one is uh, has has uh, we managed to uh, wrestle him down and. Uh, He's uh, inside. Let's see. Are any of you hurt? Uh, no. Uh, Miss Miss Lane hurt her ankle, I think. Mm. Um, getting away from them. He motions his uh, fellow policeman to begin checking the floor. He re- also then reaches down and picks up the cudgel with the nails in it. Well, look at that. That's why I called you. Well, I appreciate that. This is... This is something. Hmm. The one inside, the doctor made sure he was sedated so that you can transport him. He may have more stories to tell. You got one. Hey, well, let, let me through. He... He seems to kind of push past you into the into the, yep. the sweet room. Steps into the room where the uh, doctor is shutting up his, uh, closing his medical bag and yep. goes over and looks at the man who's cuffed and says, uh, well, he seems pretty sedated. Well, good work. Good work. He picks him up um, just by a, just by his shoulder. Give me a hand here, would you? We'll get him out in the hallway. Okay, and uh, I help him move move the uh, uh, captive. He uh, gets him out in the hallway with you, and then sets him down like into a sitting position on the floor. Should I uh, ask where the handcuffs came from? We are security for Miss Lane while she's here. Mm. They didn't bring me along for my good looks. <laughs> Well, you've done London a service. If this is the man when he comes around, if we can get a confession out of him, well, I might be able to sew up some murders. There's also a young lady in the hospital over by uh, the college. Um, She claims that her uh, husband was either kidnapped or murdered by these people. She might be able to identify some of them. How did you come across this? They were all in the Blue Pyramid Club. Hmm. She found me. Hmm. That's fortunate. He seems to stare down at the man for a moment. We've been very busy tonight. There was a... a, uh, Something of a fire in Soho. Sounds dreadful. Anyone hurt? Yes. Two or three. We're at the hospital right now, trying to overcome all of the... Smoke that they inhaled. 
Sorry to make your night a little longer, but I hope I hope that uh, this is the break in the case you were looking for. I hope it is too. Well, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, say hello to Miss Lane while we're here. It's the least I can do. Not a problem. We'll probably be relocating though. If they know where she's at, uh, they could make another attempt before then. So we'll probably be relocating. Makes sense to me. He nods, steps back in, and then goes to where the conjoining room reaches the uh, ladies' suite, and there's a knock on the door as you two are still kind of finalizing some of your packing. I call out, um, come in. The door opens. Uh, You see a tall gentleman in a policeman's uniform. Uh, He takes off his hat and tucks it under his arm. Miss Lane? Um, yes. I'm uh, okay. J- Inspector James Barrington. He reaches out his hand. I take it. Um, nice to meet you, Inspector. I'm Lillian Lane. Yes, uh, he nods to you, Miss O'Shea. Is everything all right in here? Um, we had some unwanted visitors tonight, as you can well see. Yes. So, Mr. Forsythe tells me that uh, these men may have been after you. Yeah, it's... It, it's not unusual to when I'm traveling abroad that people of unsavory sorts may sometimes think that they, uh, if they can get to me, they can get to my family's um, money. Ah, uh, yes, uh, we're somewhat familiar with that with the uh, those members of the peerage here. I can't tell you how many times I take a report down that someone wanted to get to a viscount or to a, a duke in hopes of getting to their. Uh, worldly monies doesn't work that way of course no and um if it wasn't for mr forsyth and the others uh, they they could have very well taken me tonight and um nobody would have ever seen me again hmm. well i would suggest that you follow mr forsyth's recommendation and uh, consider finding other lodgings oh absolutely i um he has wonderful ideas i We'll be sure to take all his recommendations. You see him look around the room. Hmm. Well, I hope the rest of your night is quiet. Thank you. And thank you for um, coming by so quickly. Oh, well. It seems your uh, foresight may have nabbed us uh, a very important break in a case. And I am eager to see where it leads. He puts his hat back on. If you'll excuse me. Absolutely. Well, let us know if you need anything from us. Do that indeed. He turns around. Thank you. You hear from some footsteps outside your door, and they kind of lead down towards where Forsyth is standing. Um, The inspector comes back down towards you, Mr. Forsyth, and exits the room. You see a couple of the other members of Scotland Yard are picking the man up off the floor. Uh, A... Another member of uh, their group there is covering the body with a blanket the, yep. of the deceased man. And they seem to be preparing to move him uh, on a, a gurney that they're having brought up. Just a pretty pretty simple stretcher, but just to get him out of the hallway. I will keep you as informed as the law allows. And I hope that the rest of your time in England is maybe a little quieter? I could use a bit of quiet. Good hunting, Inspector. Thank you. And the Inspector and his men, with their new captor in place, exit stage left. They do not give you back the handcuffs. Well, that's unfortunate. They're not mine anyways. (laughs) I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) And so, after a raucous night at the hotel... Uh, I think we'll pull that to a close. So we've had a wonderful evening. At least I have. I hope you have too. And uh, thank you for spending some time with us. We'll catch you back here next week.